this is also a partially challenging topic because really what I'm going to do is to air some of our dirty linen. Okay, thank you. <laughs> Just right and left. Okay. Challenges and solutions to treating common spine problems in Kisumu. So I have no disclosures. And uh, this is the way I've listed our problems. So we have staffing problems. We have problems with staff that includes equipment. We have challenges with space and systems. So staffing, we only have one full-time neurosurgeon, that is Dr. Leo Gotha. Um, I'm actually, despite me being an orthopedic surgeon, I actually teach basic sciences, so I teach anatomy. So my presence to these camps is usually limited to the period before the camps where I help in the pre-screening process, during the camps where I do rounds and participate in surgeries, and also partially after the camps where I do some follow-ups. But um, I'm trying to get a little bit more involved and have my presence throughout. That is a staffing problem. Now in terms of dedicated nurses and theater techs, we only have about five. And they're not dedicated neuro, but they usually participate during the neuro camp. Some you may know, some you have met. I think a lot of you have met Chris, and you know Chris very well, so he is actually a tech, but he tends to do a good job also in operating the CRM, getting equipment organized and stuff like that. So there's a huge staffing problem. In terms of staff, let me enumerate a few things. Um, I hope I'm not too loud, I hope I'm audible. So we do have three laminectomy sets. So two at the hospital, and one is actually one that I provide during this camp. So it's my own private set that I've been able to compile, but I usually make it available during these camps. Um, Bethwell has been gracious enough to provide one ACDF set. So it's a complete striker set that has everything, screws, cages, and everything. So really thank him for that. We do have a challenge with thoracolumbar sets, where we have three incomplete sets. And usually, if you, if you want to do any thoracolumbar fusion, you have to improvise and open all of them. And uh, Tim does have experience with that. He can, he can talk about that separately. Um, we do have two microscopes <laughs> that are non-functional. We do have a Mayfield head clamp that doesn't work. Um, we do have a C-arm that does work, but my worry about the C-arm is it hasn't been serviced in a while. So if it does break down, we are really in trouble. Um, supplies. Um, this is always a huge challenge, and um, I, I hate to have to do this, but we really struggle with supplies quite a lot. We do struggle with the drugs. Um, today, as we speak, there is limited supplies of morphine in the hospital. There is no paracetamol. There is no diclofenac. Antibiotic supplies is sporadic, and I'm not talking about you know some of the other supplies. So Victor has been gracious enough to, you know, carry his supplies from Ohio, which we normally don't have on a regular basis. You would think sutures, something as basic as sutures, should be available. They're not always available when we want them. I'm not even talking about drapes, gowns, parties, bone wax, surgical, gloves, and other things. Um, theater, so now I'm talking about the next thing, space. So we do have six theaters. Normally, um, the subspecialties are allocated one theater per week. So Lee usually has one operating day on Mondays. So I occasionally do join him on Mondays if we get additional space. Um, this space is also variable during emergencies. And usually, special arrangements are made during the neuro camps. So like you've noticed, like during this camp, you can have three or four theaters, but that means everything else has been shut down. So all other electives have been shut down. 
to create space to accommodate the additional numbers. Now, floor and ward space, there is no dedicated neuro or ward space. They're just neuro and ward rooms, quote unquote. So, you know, you've seen the way the wards are non segregated. So, you have acute rooms, you have the pediatric rooms, you have the uh, dirty rooms, and so on and so forth. So, even when you do have the neuro rooms, what happens is if, for one reason or another, they need space, an ENT patient, they'll throw him into that neuro room. Or sometimes something dangerous often happens is you can have infections right next to neuro patients. So, just like the theater space, special arrangements are usually made during neuro camps to have some additional space, which sometimes does or does not work out very well for the patients. Um, ICU is grossly inadequate, and I think that has been touched upon, and you know, it's, a, it's an evolving conversation that is going to happen. Um, additional services, um, toilets, plumbing, that's a huge challenge. Um, you have some rooms like, I mean, some people hate theatre six because the AC is not working, so it's, you know it's a boiler in there, and everyone likes theatre four because it's the only room that has a good working AC. Lighting is a problem. The theatre tables is a huge problem. Um, they barely move now. I think they only move up and down, but you can't move them forward or backward. So if you have any challenging cases with you know, the movement of the CM, thoracic spine, APs, that's a huge challenge now. Um, computers and software, there's only one functioning laptop now. The screens are not working. Systems. Um, so financing is an additional challenge. Um, so what has happened is recently, I think the National Hospital Insurance Fund has helped cushion some of the costs, and that has somewhat helped. However, there needs to be a deliberate push to support these neuro camps. I don't think we're being fair to the visiting teams to have them moving in with everything. They have come from 10,000 kilometers to be here. They have volunteered their time and their money. So I don't think it's, it's, it's really fair, but that's an evolving conversation that we will have on ourselves, on, we'll have by ourselves. Um, also systems to track supplies and consumables and service equipment that is lacking. Then one important thing that needs to be discussed is, you know, what are our plans? with this neuro camps. How sustainable do we want this to be? Do we want it to be just be a revolving door where the teams come, operate, leave until the next team comes? Or do we really want you know to build capacity? Is this really is, is skills transfer really happening? So I think that ties in to strategic planning. And this are hospital-wide systems that need to be developed and discussed. Then I think um, Dr. Gala has talked about data collection and dissemination. I won't talk much on that. Um, theatre systems also need to be developed, where, as it is right now, everything is so ad hoc and disorganized, and we really need to pull, pull our socks up to develop organograms and you know, lines of responsibility, infection control protocols, tracking supplies and consumables, and emergency protocols. Same thing applies to the flow on the wards, where we need to develop patient care algorithms and SOPs, plus mortality meetings. And mortality meetings, not so much to apportion blame for what has or what hasn't worked, but really to develop and improve patient care. Now, um, like I said, this is not a very easy talk. 
And uh, I do have suggestions to solution to some of these problems, but I was hoping that we would stimulate discussion and enumerate some of these solutions. Thank you. Thank you so much for bringing up all the important points. I think it's a good opportunity for us to discuss, but the main, one of the main um, players should be around, and that's the hospital management and from the government side. Because it's, we are only part of one team, you know. There is a chain of actors playing here. And unless and until the hospital management will not be actively involved, the county not actively involved, there won't be any sustainable solution because we are only bringing the skills, we are bringing the items. I saw yesterday uh, Patel coming with a huge six bags. You know, it cannot continue. One day it will stop. So we have to find a solution where things are being delivered locally. The supplies are made locally or supplies are, are provided by the hospital. And I'm so shocked. Where do we stand in one year or two years if we don't have paracetamols? Surgery needs painkillers. Pain and if we are deprived of these, and the hospital, the management cannot provide. So I don't think so. Uh, it, there is a good, uh, big hope that there will be a sustain, sustainability. Um, and secondly, for example, the toilet issue you have. I have volunteered last time that we can chip together and build a toilet. But you know these are the things which should come from the hospital side. And one of the points, uh, I think you were the one who said NIF, and all the patients get free treatment. I, don't th I think we should dig uh, deep into it. It's not the free treatment the patients get. It is covered by the insurance. And the hospital is getting uh, uh, you know, financial support out of this. So where does this money is being invested? Is it invested in the neurosurgical department? Is it invested in some other uh, work in the hospital? So I think the, uh, one of the key players, uh, the two key, uh, main key players should be in the talks. Otherwise, uh, I, don't, I don't see a future. So um, Anita, um, I want to thank you for your observation. And um, despite me standing here, and like I said, airing out some of our data in it, um, there has been some progress. It is, it is slow, and um, it is actually frustrating, but um, it is an evolving conversation. So please, keep coming. <laughs> <laughs> Don't give up, we still need you. And um, just, just my own personal experience, let me just, just take a minute to talk about my own personal experience, is, um, you know, during my, my training, I trained in Eldoret, which is about two and a half, three hours from here. Um, part of orthopedic training is spine rotation. And uh, since I wasn't examined in spine, you know, we hated it. We hated it, and you know, the spine practice also wasn't really developed back then. Huh? So I think, I don't know if any of you did ACDS with tricortical bone graft. Um, so, so that was it. So we ortho bros, uh, our, <laughs> our role was limited to harvesting the graft. The neuro folks would place it in the neck, and it, there was no CM then. So you know, you'd place wires and, um, and you know, artery forceps and all sorts of things. Then you'd have a mobile x-ray come in, take a picture, then you have to figure out which level it is. Huh? So there was no big enthusiasm to get involved in, 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 in spying back then. However, I came to Kisumu. And there was also no neurosurgeon. And um, we were only three auto residents back then. Huh? So it was a time of trauma, and I really became good at trauma. But enter Kisumu, and I just developed a referral line. So any spine case that I couldn't handle, recalcitrant to the normal oral drugs that we would do, or epidural injections, I'd refer. Then Lee showed up. And, um, you know, we started off small, started off doing lamis. 
and you know he showed me how to do laminectomies first, you know, starting from exposure, and um, you know I've shared this this story once or twice before, but my first derotomy happened during my first laminectomy, so Lee has exposed nicely, he's removed the lamina, he's shown me the ligamentum flavor, then he gave me the what's that this thing called, the pituitary. Yeah, so you take a bite and then you go deal me. But anyway, that's a story for another day. Victor. <laughs> How much uh, funding comes from the national government, county government, and uh, uh, do they support the hospital? Being that it's a county government, a county hospital, um, are, and it's a regional referral center, mm -hmm. Um, how much, I mean, do they get funding from the national government and the county government, and is any of that going to work to neurosurgery? Um, so here's the thing, and um, I'm sorry for doing this, but Edwin, Edwin who represents the, 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 the hospital administration, is here. So at some point, we'll get him to, to speak up. But um, so, so um, the Jaramogi is a regional hospital. So they do receive conditional grants. But these conditional grants are grossly inadequate to provide good neuro and by extension auto care. Most of it goes to taking care of salaries and you know food and other you know other what I would say priority areas, quote unquote. However, that being said, these neuro camps do provide a unique opportunity to get additional funding. Like you said, like, like Anita has clearly pointed out earlier, that most of these patients now do have some form of national health insurance, and all these surgeries actually do give, do generate some money for, for the hospital. So this is a unique opportunity to leverage some of these funds to actually take care of, particularly some of these recurrent issues that tend to come up, eh? that don't require a lot of money, you know, stuff like parties, stuff like gowns, stuff like drugs, you know, this really shouldn't be happening. I think one of the challenges we've had with, uh, you know, uh, ever since we established this program, mm -hmm. education was really high on the list, and that's why we have things like this symposium. Um, education and skills transfer has always been priority. I think the biggest challenge, and I appreciate anesthesia because we can come here and do surgery with excellent anesthesia care. You know, we, 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 we use your anesthesiologist, and we don't have to necessarily bring an anesthesiologist, which last year we did. Um, but. Uh, uh, you know, as far as the scrub text and the circulators, one of the things we've been trying to do is that in every case we have a circulator from our team and a scrub tech and a circulator from your team and the same for scrub techs. Uh, I think one of the biggest challenges is keeping those people in the room. I can never keep track of where they, the, the, within two minutes of the case starting, they disappeared. How do we, how do we change that? Uh, it's, it's almost every single case it's difficult for them to stay in the room. Is it because they're short-staffed? Is it because we are intimidating? I, I don't know what it is. So Victor, now let me offer one of my solutions. Is um, I, I do like your approach to the neurosurgical camps where you do focus on quality rather than quantity. Now what I would like to encourage you to do is slow down a little bit. Slow down a little bit. Um, like. Um, teach, take some time, like in the morning, even before starting the case. Huh? We can even have a separate room where you know, pick a topic. Like we're talking about improving nursing care. So you can have a nurse talk about wound care, how to take care of drains and that sort of thing. That's a topic for another, for one day, for example. Then you can have one of you folks, the new neurosurgeons, teach residents. And you can start from the, right at the bottom of the pyramid, neurological exam. So start with those, that simple stuff that's really going to make a huge difference. And it doesn't matter even if you do two or three cases in a day. If you focus on that whole broad spectrum, that's actually going to make a huge difference. So 
Um, my take home message from whatever it is that I'm saying is just slow down a little bit, and that will help. I appreciate that. Yeah. Um, One of the difficulties, too, is, OK, for example, resident teaching. Mm -hmm. Um, sometimes we can't find them. Mm -hmm. You know, I had one resident that came from um, past Nairobi, Machakos, to work with us, mm -hmm. but there was no local resident. Mm -hmm. This is a resident that came from out of town. He's the only resident that I saw that showed interest um, and participated every day in every case. But it would be nice to see that the local residents are getting involved and participating a little bit more. Okay. I'd like to go a few steps back. I think uh, is this, this, this issue of uh, funding, the MHI funding, I know it's a, it's a difficult topic, but this is something we really have to, we have to speak about this. Yeah. We have to really, I think we can, I propose that we, we speak about it tomorrow, maybe when we've all slept, about, <laughs> slept one night over it, but I think it's an issue that needs to be dealt with. Because um, at some point you'll get exhausted. Yeah, if you know there's, there's, there's actually some funding coming in and some basic things are not available. So I propose we, we, we discuss this tomorrow when all the, the, all, all the uh, team players, all the people you know, involved are there. Yeah? So I don't know what the others think. But and, I, and, and Tim, um, I, I, I do agree with you. Yeah. And, um, and it's an important meeting. And um, you know, my, my suggestion is, you know, because I know you personally, just you know, bullet to the forehead, please don't, don't sugarcoat anything. <laughs> yeah, but like yeah. I said, part of this conversation, we can't, we can't. I mean, time is too short, and some of this is an evolving conversation. You know, I'm happy that we are uh, having this conversation. Um, <clears throat> two things. Uh, the, today there was a meeting between uh, the professional uh, organizations and the proposed SHIF uh, so that uh, to try and see about the funding me uh, 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 mechanisms and the onboarding. Now, I think the next series of meetings, the person who is uh, like um, uh, neuroscience or the clinical organization, we, we should have the presentation so that we can say um, <clears throat> you're not just doing a kinesomy, you're doing a kinesomy, you are clipping and analyzing, you are going to put a neural patch, so so that the, 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 the charging is not just for a kinesomy. So if we are going to do a kinesomy for, 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 for an extra deal, and, you, and it's not the same as kinesomy for analyzing. But those people, they don't know. They do not differentiate because they say the minimal charge, uh, for example. Same thing, you're going to do a, a difficult um, a rig, uh, spine surgery, which is going to be, take you almost of six hours uh, with all those complications. So is it the same as, uh, as doing a uh, uh, and uh, screw, a particular screw fusion? But coming to the other, the governance issues, the governance issues, we have to put our foot on the ground. And that's why I was, I'm, I'm, you know, I'm combining the issue of the global neurosurgery, because the global neurosurgery can help us to cement some of these things. Um, my friend here is in a good cahoots with the uh, uh, governing uh, system in this country. So we have seen um, some uh, institutions that have uh, invested in the health, in their healthcare system. Uh, they have bought new things. And I think from here, we should not shy away. Uh, let us use uh, that opportunity, uh, even if it is for this to, to invest in, a, whether it is a win, that you're going to do uh, orthopedic and, you know, uh, neuro and spine. It's just a being within the hospital so that you can have uh, uh, invest in those things. And I think since we still have a few years to go, it is possible to have that if it is put on the table. Right? The other thing is amongst ourselves, we must put a, a, a minimum uh, 
you know, and, and Vic is very good at bringing this team. But you don't have to bring this team twice a year because you brought them this time. This is the number of uh, surgeries you did, and this is because of one, two, three. So you will want to come again after one, two, three has been met, and let that be pushed. If the system, if the hospital administration thinks there's a good thing coming out of here, if the hospital thinks, yeah, yes, we are getting more money from NHF, no, SHF, because of this kind of outcome, if the government thinks, yes, we are getting some kind of medical tourism because of this, what is happening around here, then that is the, those, that, that, those are the points that we should, shall use in our shape. Thank you. So, so thank you, Doc. And, um, and um, you know, as, as, as the mic is being passed around, let me also again highlight my own personal experience and growth during these camps. So, you know, I've, I've had this, this unique opportunity to be sitting on, you know, this side of the theater table, so to speak, and, you know, to watch how they operate. And the one thing that I do appreciate is um, the quality of surgeries. As in, by this I mean, and uh, I don't know how to put this parliament, and put it as best as I could, is these guys try and offer our patients care like they would in the U.S. So they do a good job, and I learn tips and tricks from every single one of them. I can tell you exactly what Tim has taught me how to do. I can tell you what exactly Victor has taught me how to do, what Gala has taught me how to do, and you know, my author bro, Dr. Hanala, you know, in the, in the last few days. So if, if there's anything that um, I want to feel encouraged is my own personal growth from these camps. So please keep coming, but we'll keep also trying to improve. There are some things that don't require funding, showing up on time. You know, theater turnover. How can these guys come all this way? Then you're cutting at 11. What excuse do you really have? So, um, just a, a brief comment, and it, it's, it's, it's a difficult uh, circumstance, and I think it's a conversation that can only be had by the local surgeons or the, you know, the, 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 the stakeholders that are um, either local or expats that come back. Uh, but it's, it's a familiar conversation, and if it makes you feel any better, it's not very different than the United States when neurosurgeons are told that they're not valuable to the hospital that they're working in, although they work very hard and do a large number of complicated cases with high quality. And I think that we were talking about this just the other day, the, the, the three of us, where what's going to be necessary is that you're, you're going to have to engage the administration and the silly term is uh, uh, sunlight is the greatest disinfectant, right? So you have to see what the numbers are to find out what the hospitals are gaining by these camps or by your practice so that you can show them that there's value in these cases and whether it's the camps that are providing it or whatever, it's the expertise that you're now providing it, that will hopefully allow you to say, well, I can't do a laminectomy without cottonoid patties. I can't do a case without gowns, caps, and gloves. Uh, the very, very basic things on your wish list. You are not asking for a $2 million navigation system. You're asking for some of the basic uh, elements of, of doing procedures. So I, I think it's not unreasonable uh, when you uh, discuss these things that hopefully that those numbers are things that you may get some access to. Am I confident that you'll get all access? No, because even in the United States, there's a shell game in terms of what happens financially in the institution. So don't feel like you're alone in that regard. But I think that that's a conversation that will be crucial to the durability of the hospital and these programs. Because without that, you're right, the hospital will continue to make money and uh, do very well by these programs. And if they don't give anything back to the people that are doing it, and we continue to provide all of those elements that they're not paying for, and they don't have to pay for them, why would they? So, and if we're not here to provide them, you know, then, then you won't have them. 
and that doesn't make sense for a proper uh, program uh, to have its own identity and its own, um, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, durability uh, into for the future. So, yeah. So I think Lee, Lee has something to say. Yes. The, as the mic is to him, um, so Dr. Gala, um, let me use me as an example. If there's any reason to come back, please come back for my sake. And not just my sake, but um, we do have actually a resident over here. He's a general surgeon resident, Albert, but he's taken an interest in these neuro camps. And I do also have a fourth year medical student who is actually interested. So just come at least for the skills transfer. Yeah, no, and I, and I think the, the, the one thing that I continue to bring is, is not gowns and cottonoids and bandages. It's, while it still works, is mm -hmm. my, my knowledge base, and I think that that's the one thing that I can share freely mm -hmm. and not worry. Mm -hmm. Until I lose my mind. Thank, thanks, uh, thanks also, also for um, shedding light on some of the data issues and areas. Bad things tend to fast and grow in the dark. So thank you for that uh, courageous step. I agree entirely with Dr. Ogutu that we need to have a frank conversation in the presence of um, the leadership and also the administration. A point I'd like to make is that since I met um, Dr. Awor and Dr. Ogutu and Dr. Laure and the rest of the, the teams that have been visiting us, the uh, one thing they made very clear is that they wanted neurosurgery to become routine in Kisumu. Because the statement I think I remember that I was saying once was that before the initiative wasn't really much going on here. And when they started, it's like neurosurgery would come with them and leave with them. And so the hope had been that over time, we would break through that intermittency. So that you have continuity, and every time a team visits you have a new peak, where you're doing more challenging things, where you're having more learning going on, and so on. Now, I think the challenge we've had here is, is twofold. One is those um, leadership and other issues that you brought up. And second is a perception issue that neurosurgery is a kind of a luxury field and it is external to us. And it only happens when people come from far away with a lot of sophisticated things. Yet what Dr. Gala was pointing out is that there's a lot of low-hanging fruit. And I think what your presentation has pointed out is that there's a lot of low-hanging fruit that does not require people to come from thousands of miles away to execute or to implement. And if the agenda is growth, then one of the things that has to stop is this intermittency. Now, what you guys as visitors may not know is that uh, intermittency has now translated into our patient population. So my residents here and Dr. Adele will attest that when there's a neuro camp, we have a flood of spam patients and cranial cases and some really um, challenging things to do. When the camp goes away, those patients vanish. I'll have my clinics on Tuesday and I'll have one or two degenerative spine patients to see, and it's quiet. And then when a camp is announced, I'll have a clinic and be sitting there until 9.30 at night, trying to see patients and trying to figure out who's a good candidate and who's not. And that is, I think, the biggest um, uh, challenge we have right now and what we really have to fight is that message and that perception that these are things we cannot do. And that has been kind of encouraged by the way the institution has treated neurosurgery. Dr. Dada, the things you're mentioning about showing that neurosurgery can be um, a foundational field and can earn hospital considered revenue, you demonstrated that. And the response has been inertia. And maybe the conversation we should be having is how we shift that heavy low, that heavy rock, and just get it rolling downhill. Because I think once it starts rolling, the direction is that it will accelerate and it will grow. So thank you, uh, Dr. Walter, uh, for the team kindly do not give up. It, uh, it is uh, difficult to get the stone rolling, but we really need your help and um, your weight, literally, to push and to help us get over that. And I think once that is done, um, there will be progress. And I appreciate uh, Dr. Uh, Walter's uh, suggestion of the education every morning. So to that end, I promise you, going forward, we're going to have someone from our team, before every surgery, present something. But someone from your team, you'll assign them to present something. Okay. That way, we have education coming from someone who's local and will also present something. 
So that way the teams are interacting and we'll meet right there in front of the board and someone will present a five minute thing, a local person from the hospital and someone from our team every day going forward.